thank you very much, Francis, for that very generous introduction. In fact, the first uh, EHS conference I ever attended was uh, here in York in 1989, uh, where I was just uh, uh, saying to uh, Claire Cross, who was then the incoming president, who I was very pleased to see today, that uh, I was rather embarrassed because I missed her talk because I was coming up from London uh, by coach. Uh, and so I remember arriving just in time to hear Owen Chadwick give the vote of thanks at the end. Uh, so if anyone turns up late here, I know where they've come. Perhaps they've also uh, chosen uh, coach to arrive. Well, what's in a title? As someone who, as Francis has been telling you, is we now engaged in trying to write an account of the making of Roman Catholicism as a world religion, what she didn't tell you, it's for the best part of a decade, I have naturally been pondering on the processes by means of which Christianity came to be translated to all four continents of the then known world. But as the quotation from Umberto Eco, with which I opened the call for papers, for this conference suggests, translation is always a shift, not between two languages, but between two cultures. This was by no means a straightforward process, and certainly not as straightforward as the following <coughs> all too famous and propagandistic representation of Christian missionary reach might suggest. Andrea Pozzo's dizzying fresco covering the nave of the Church of San Ignazio in Rome carried out between 1691 and 94, has become the go-to image for any publisher or author who wants a striking symbol to stand for the making of Roman Catholicism as a world religion in the early modern period. Indeed, its own creator, himself a Jesuit, described it as follows. My idea in the painting was to represent the works of St. Ignatius and of the Company of Jesus in spreading the Christian faith worldwide. In the first place, I embraced the entire vault with a building depicted in perspective. Then, in the middle of this, I painted the three persons of the Trinity, from the breast of one of which, that, this, that is the human son, issue forth rays that wound the heart of St. Ignatius, and from him they issue as a reflection spread to the four parts of the world depicted in the guise of Amazons. Europa and America here. <coughs> Although Roman Catholicism might have reached all four <coughs> continents by the time Pozzo came to paint this fresco, it had limited impact in two of them, Asia and Africa, had been creatively reinterpreted in a third, the Americas, and expelled from significant parts of the fourth, Europe. Moreover, the fiercely defended royal monopoly over ecclesiastical appointments in the Portuguese and Spanish overseas empires, known respectively as the Padrado Real and the Patronato Real, meant that the papacy was in no position to assert full jurisdiction over the missions until well into the 20th century. As I've noted elsewhere, if one were to make an honest appraisal of world geopolitics in around 1500, the subsequent global spread of Roman Catholicism, for all its fits and starts, as well as its patchy unevenness, seemed highly unlikely. To begin with, Columbus famously failed to find what he was looking for, a shortcut to the east, which from the time of the collapse of the Roman Empire down to the mid-19th century was unquestionably the wealthiest part of this globe, rather than the discovery of a new world. The promise and potential of the Americas as either a fertile field of Christian conversion or for economic exploitation, had yet to make its impact. Save for such relative, relatively isolated communities as the Syriac Thomas Christians of southwestern India, the Syriac Maronite Church of Antioch, the minority Coptic Church of Egypt, and the Coptic Kingdom of Ethiopia, Christendom was effectively boxed into the western extremity of the Eurasian landmass by considerable Islamic powers, notably the Ottoman Empire to the east and the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt to the southeast. In North Africa, from Morocco to Tunis, Portuguese and Spanish influence was precarious and restricted to the coastline. Furthermore, on the coast of, the, of Sicily and the Italian peninsula, the inhabitants were careful to locate their settlements in secure locations inland. 
a curious and inconvenient detail which still puz uh, puzzles enterprising beach lovers who holiday in remote parts of Sicily and Calabria and Puglia to this day. <coughs> Although this did little to protect the local po population from countless raids made by Barbary corsairs, even if the number of those thereby cast into white slavery, to use Bob Davis's term, do not compete with the numbers of their black counterparts brutally transported across the Atlantic. In East Asia, Islam had been enjoying a wave of continuous expansion ever since the ruler of the Malay port of Malacca decided to adopt Islam sometime between 1409 and 1436 and thereby plug his economy into a flourishing trading network that stretched via Bengal and Hormuz to Cairo and ultimately Istanbul. The pace of Islam conversion was to accelerate from around 1500 in parallel with and not unrelated to the arrival of Christianity. Meanwhile, in the Americas, the Aztec and Inca kingdoms had reached their apogee. While in China, the Ming had admittedly abandoned their early 15th century practice of sending gargantuan armadas on flag-waving voyages as far as East Africa. But this was not in response to hostile reception, but because of perceived irrelevance to China's continental concerns as Asia's most considerable power. In 1501, Shah Ismail seized Tabriz and inaugurated the Safavid Empire, which unified Iran and which, under Shah Abbas the Great, 1587 to 1629, reached the climax of its power. In the territory represented by modern-day Afghanistan, Zahir Uddin Babur, the great-grandson of Tamerlane, was poised to invade the Indian subcontinent. He would establish what came to be known as the Mughal Empire, in which a Muslim minority ruled successfully for more than two centuries over a Hindu majority. If the early modern period, as has been argued recently, notably by John Darwin, was in global terms an age of empire, then the West had but a single contestant, the Habsburgs, who managed to unite their various Burgundian, Austrian and Spanish patrimonies with the title of Holy Roman Emperor for just a little under four decades, 1519 to 1556. To borrow Gibbon's famous remark that, had it not been for Charles Martel's victory over the Arabs at the Battle of Poitiers in 732, the interpretation of the Quran would perhaps now be taught in the schools of Oxford and her pulpits might demonstrate to a circumcised people the sanctity and truth of the revelation of Muhammad. One might with no less justification remark that had it not been for the need for the Ottomans repeatedly to turn their attention to the Safavid threat to their southeast border, the 137-metre-high steeple of Vienna Cathedral would merely have been the first such spire to provide the muezzin with a substitute for his usual minaret from which to call the faithful to prayer. The triumph of the West over the rest, over the rest would have to wait until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Even then, it was a victory expressed in terms of economic and political rather than religious dominance. The Scottish explorer and missionary to Africa, David Livingstone, famously converted just two Africans to Christianity, one of whom subsequently changed their mind. <laughs> so it's perhaps not such a surprise to learn that there was not a single African in attendance at the landmark World Missionary Conference which met in Edinburgh in 1910. Indeed, the Christian century in Africa had not yet begun and is still very much in progress. While in 1950 only about 15% of the population of sub-Saharan African was Christian, by 2010 it had risen to over 60%, and just under 24% of the world's 2.2 billion Christians lived in the continent. In 2050, according to the latest figures from the Pew Research Center, this proportion will rise to 38%, which will represent a sea change in the regional distribution of Christianity in the world since as recently as 2010, there were equal numbers of Christians in Europe, Latin America, and Africa, representing some 75% of the world's total, at around 25% each. Finally, it has been speculated that by 2050, one in four Christians in Europe and North America will be from the Christian South. Historians are usually warned they should forget the future and try to view the period they study as far as possible 
in its own terms. Hindsight is seen to be a hindrance. However, it can also be a help, which I believe is the case here. We need to appreciate that Christianity, let alone Roman Catholicism, was not yet a world religion by the dawn of the 20th century. The 19th century, that second heroic chapter in global missions, notwithstanding the labours of such biblical translators as John Ross, about whom James Grayson will be talking in his plenary on Thursday, was even less, this century was even less successful than the first, the early modern period, in that the proportion of the world's population that was Christian in 1800 was little different from what it was in 1900. It is only in our own time that the global shift south is taking place. And I think all this should help us recalibrate our understanding of what was actually achieved during the first phase of extra-European mission that coincided with the so-called Age of Discovery. The traditional Italian coupling, traditore, traditore, translator, traitor, should be enough to disabuse anyone who still thinks, along with Paul Ricoeur, that the so-called hermeneutic of suspicion was an invention of the 19th and 20th centuries, courtesy of Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Concern with language and meaning had been put onto a new footing over 300 years earlier by humanists such as Lorenzo Valla and Desiderius Erasmus, both of whom published revised Latin translations of the Gospels with polemical intent. Before the Reformation itself provoked a wave of new, no less polemical, vernacular translations of the entire Bible. The magisterial and Calvinist reformations on the one hand and the counter-reformation on the other then saw unprecedented attempts at censorship of both written and oral culture by both positive and negative means. In the Roman Catholic world, this was at least partially achieved by the issue of standard Roman editions of key religious works, which included not only the Vulgate, but also the, the liturgical service books such as the Breviary and the Missal. Revealingly, the first of these Roman editions was the Roman Catechism, which was issued in 1566, there on the left, on the right, and uh, soon after the official edition of the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. And this was accompanied by the publication of a series of indexes of prohibited books shown here on the left, not only in Rome, and in fact in the 16th century at least 32 editions were published in Europe, out of which only six were published in printed in Rome, which was no more than the number of editions published in the space of just 12 years, 1544 to 1556, by the Sorbonne in Paris. By means of these lists, the authorities sought, with only qualified success, it must be said, to exert control over the circulation of heterodox opinions. Rome followed up its efforts by founding a curial standing committee, the Congregation of the Index in 1571, to supplement that of the Holy Office or Inquisition, which had been founded a few decades earlier in 1542. In her gripping 1997 study, La Biblia al Rogo, whose title works even better, I think, in English, The Bible at Stake, Giuliola Franito showed how, on the occasion of the publication of the 1596 edition of the Roman Index, the Holy Office trumped not only the jurisdiction of the Congregation of the Index, but even papal authority in its assertion of the power of veto over bishops, who, according to no less authority than the Council of Trent, have been given discretion in cases of the granting to individuals of permission to read the Bible in the vernacular. More recently, Martin Neswig has shown that beginning in the 1570s in New Spain, that's to say uh, present-day Mexico, there was a campaign against translation of parts of the Bible into the most widely spoken local vernacular, Nahuatl. More recently still, David Tavares has asked us to reassess the significance of a particularly tantalizing might have been in the Mesoamerican translation of Christianity, which is the failed attempt at around the same time by Franciscan missionaries to have their Nahua translation of Thomas Akempi's Imitatio Christi published. But enough of the untranslated translation of Christianity in the age of reformations. For my focus today will lie elsewhere. Since, as can be seen from the call to papers, I have deliberately chosen to understand translation in its broadest sense, so as to include pilgrimage, both physical and virtual, 
conversion, and the movement of relics, as well as the rendition of texts in another language from the original. Though time prevents me today at least on dealing with more than two of Pozzo's four parts of the world, Europe and the Americas. In his presidential address to the American Catholic Historical Association, delivered in December 1990 and published the following year in the Catholic Historical Review, the Jesuit historian John O'Malley memorably pointed out how, not only in his early years, Loyola's eyes were set on Jerusalem, not Wittenberg. O'Malley's doctoral work on the Augustinian eschatological preacher Giles of Viterbo would have made him all too aware of the enduring power down to the Renaissance and beyond of the idea of Rome as New Jerusalem. Giles compared the Tiber to the River Jordan and Etruria as the New Holy Land. And here the friar was simply building on the patristic idea of Christ's baptism as marking the passing from the law of the old dispensation to the new Christian faith of redemption. Looking back, I now realise that O'Malley's call for us to avoid identifying Loyola exclusively with the Counter-Reformation has been a guiding light to those of us who try to understand early modern Catholicism. For we need to remember not only Ignatius's physical pilgrimage to the Holy Land, where he embarrassed and irritated the Franciscan guardians of the holy places enough with his clumsy attempts to court martyrdom to be bundled onto a ship back to Venice. But his mental evocation of it in that, quote, shock tactic spiritual gymnastic to be undertaken and performed under guidance, end quote. To borrow Utram Evanet's unforgettable description of Loyola's guide to those reading, ret leading retreats, the spiritual exercises. And I can't resist showing you here a rather unusual uh, edition of the spiritual exercises, which was uh, translated into Arabic by the improbably named French Jesuit Pierre Fromage, made in, the, <laughs> made in the city of Sidon in 1731. At the beginning of this manuscript, Loyola is expressly referred to as the founder of, quote, Jesuit monasticism. A number of these Arabic manuscripts actually uh, were known, are known to survive in Maronite collections, and the Maronite author Gabriel Fahat composed an Arabic spiritual manual based on the exercises. As the recent studies of Catherine Rudy and Catherine Beebe have demonstrated, the practice of imagined or virtual pilgrimage, whereby the devout were able to translate themselves, in their imagination at least, to the Holy Land, was still flourishing by the end of the 15th century. It was undertaken particularly by those, such as nuns and other pious women living in the world, who had fewer opportunities to make the physical journey. In works such as the Sion Pilga, by the 15th century observant Dominican Felix Fabri, who visited the Holy Land twice, once in 1480 to Jerusalem and again in 1483-84, when he made the further pilgrimage to the St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, the nuns in his spiritual charge in the German city of Ulm were encouraged to evoke in mental prayer the places where Christ walked, talked, suffered and was crucified and arose from the dead in order to intensify their apprehension of the passion story. Here is an image from Bernhard von Bredenbach's copiously illustrated Peregrinatio in Terram Sanctum of 1486. And Bredenbach actually was uh, together with Fabry on, on Fabry's second pilgrimage. Now, the virtual translation of the holy places as a way of structuring meditation had its counterpart in the physical recreation of places associated with Christ's life and passion in Western Europe. These so-called passion parks or miniature replicas of Jerusalem or key buildings within it may be found from Brazil to Bologna, Granada in Andalusia to Gorlitz near the Polish border. Several of you here today might remember the wonderful paper uh, on the Bolognese evocation of the Holy Sepulchre uh, given by a former president of this society, Colin Morris at UEA, and published in volume 33 of the Salvation Church History of the Church Retrospective. Now, perhaps the most famous manifestation of this phenomena is the series of Sacri Monti, or Holy Mountains, which formed a kind of confessional cordon sanitaire, or string of watchtowers, on the borders of Piedmont and Lombardy, with the Calvinist cantons of Switzerland. Overseen by observant Franciscans, who, as we have noted, also had responsibility for the holy places in, Jeru in Palestine, these included the mini-Jerusalem at Varallo, much favoured as a place of meditation by that model counter-reformation prelate, San Carlo Borromeo, 
to whom I shall be returning. Here on the left is the Sacramonte uh, of Varallo, as depicted in the series of canvases of Borromeo's life, commissioned to hang in Milan Cathedral as part of the campaign uh, to raise uh, money for his canonization in 1610. Begun in 1491, Varallo was the first of the Sacramonte to be built in the Italian peninsula. We're on the right at Varese, which consists of a string of 14 chapels dedicated to the mysteries of the rosary, climaxing in a medieval chapel where the 15th one is uh, at the top, uh, is from over a century later, starting in 1605. All the Sacramonte were populated by numerous brightly painted full-scale figures who recreated uh, um, scenes from the life and passion of Christ. And that's one here. It's the Ecce Homo chap uh, th um, ch um, Chapel number 33 at Varallo. The translation of the topography of Jerusalem could also be imposed on an existing urban landscape. In 1659, the North Italian Scomascan priest, Lorenzo Longo, published a brief 24-page booklet entitled Jerusalem Piacentina, or to give it its full title in English translation, The Places of Piacenza Corresponding to the Holy Places of Jerusalem, which may be visited by the faithful and devout servants of God, so they might meditate on the most holy life, passion, death, and resurrection of our Saviour Jesus Christ with great spiritual profit. In the preface, Longo compared his grafting of the topography of Jerusalem onto this small town situated on the River Po, some 70 kilometers due south of Milan, with the presence of models of the Holy House of Loreto in the nearby cities of Alessandria and Como. And he then mentioned the various places in Piacenza where there were already particular signs, scenes sorry, from the life of Christ evoked, overwhelmingly uh, the evocations of the Holy Crib. In order to emphasize the convenience afforded by his guide, Longo remarked how the capture of the holy places by the Ottomans in 1517 had made physical pilgrimage very difficult. Incidentally, I'm sure that such sales talk has been significantly responsible for the underestimation underestima of the significance of physical pilgrimage during the 16th and 17th centuries to the Holy Land. It's at this point that Longo also mentioned the Sacramonte at Varallo, which is less than 100 kilometers from Piacenza. Before taking the reader or listener through the streets of Piacenza, Longo talked of how the whole of Lombardy and Piedmont, for which he used the classical Roman label, Gallia Cisalpina, might be considered as a kind of virtual Palestine, with Tortona standing in for Gaza, Como as Tyre, Monza as Caesarea, Milan as Jaffa, and the Adda as the River Jordan, which really does stretch the imagination. <laughs> the fact that all this information was delivered in the form of a poem suggests that perhaps Longo intended it to be memorized by the dutiful pilgrim and recited before the local counterparts to the key sites of the Passion story. The booklet closed with a careful enumeration of the spiritual bounty which pilgrims would gain for their labors in the form of a list of the indulgences. This brings me to what linked all these practices. That they enabled not only those who journeyed all the way to the Holy Land to benefit from the generous indulgences which such an act of piety brought with it. Of course, indulgences have not had a very good press, particularly since 1517. <laughs> but, as Liz Tingle shows in her new fine book, Indulgences After Luther, Pardons in Counter-Reformation France, the triumphant revival of the cult of saints and of Catholic devotions more generally in the Counter-Reformation Church is inconceivable without indulgences. They were the glue, if you like, which held the whole edifice together and which, as we shall see, collapsed devotional distance by making possible global cults of such relics close, closely associated with Rome as the icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary held in the Roman Basilica uh, of Santa Maria Maggiore and known sometimes as the Salus Populi uh, Romano. Owing to its alleged role in bringing about the end of the plague to the city at the time of Pope Gregory the Great at the end of the 6th century. It's also sometimes referred to as the Madonna of the Snows, and that's after the alleged miracle of an August snowfall caused by the Virgin to indicate where she wanted the basilica in her honor to be built. I show here not only the original icon there on the left, but also on the right, the copy in a contemporary print 
which the third Father General of the Jesuits, Francisco Borja, had specially requested the right to make from Pope Pius V in 1567. This image, translated into local variants, thus became a global trademark, if you like, for the society, even more than the famous IHS monogram, as can be seen in my next slide. The print of the official copy of the Salas Popoli Romani, flanked on the right by what I call the Ricci Madonna from the Field Museum in Chicago, because it's probably the closest we will find of the lost copy of, of the Western prototype, which was gifted to the Wan Li Emperor by the Italian missionary, uh, but then passed very quickly on by the Emperor, who found it very disquieting that the Virgin's eyes appeared to follow him around the room. And he gave it to his mother-in-law, who apparently was delighted with it. And on the left, we have a very unusual uh, uh, um, canvas of St. Luke painting Our Lady of the Snows by the Mexican mestizo artist Juan Correa, dating from the end of the 17th century. Here is the famous print attributed to Etienne Dupérat and published by the French-born adoptive Italian engraver Antonio Lafrari in time for the holy year of 1575 which, with its 400,000 pilgrim visitors, saw the launch of Rome as the capital of a world religion. It depicts, in very much idealised terms, pilgrims processing between the seven major basilicas of the Eternal City, which stood for the seven key sites in the Passion Narrative that were evoked in the prayers and meditations of those taking part. No earlier maps of the city had ever populated the city in quite this way. Rome is not simply represented, but shown in action. Such prints would have been bought by pilgrims to take home with them as souvenirs of their visit to the city. And it should be seen, in the words of Barbara Bisch, as a kind of didactic memory guide for reliving the Holy Year experience or transforming the potential pilgrims into actual ones. The print also conveys Rome's claim to have become a new Jerusalem, as home to so many physical testimonies to the apostolic origins of Christianity. These comprised not only buildings, but also bones, relics of the early Christian martyrs, whose number was to increase exponentially only a matter of three years after the 1575 Jubilee, for which this print was conceived. This was owing, as many of you will know, to the accidental rediscovery of the so-called catacombs of Priscilla underneath an orchard just northeast of the city walls in 1578, combined with the pious identification of all those buried within them as victims of Roman imperial persecution. This discovery of what one contemporary authority described grandiloquently as a subterranean city ushered in the biggest boost in relic traffic since the Venice-led pillaging of Constantinople on the occasion of the so-called Fourth Crusade in 1204, some of the consequences of which Anne Lester will be telling us about tomorrow. Here on the slide in front of you are two illustrations from what might be called the Atlas of this New World, Roma Soterania, published posthumously uh, the author of the, the Maltese Antonio Bosio in 1635 whom the 19th century founder of the discipline of Christian archaeology, Giovanni de Rossi, memorably christened the Columbus of the Catacombs. The next 150 years or so were to see Roman catacomb relics translated throughout the Catholic world, particularly to frontier zones, where churches, which had been used and thereby despoiled by Protestants, were required by canon law to have authenticated relics under their altars if they were to be canonically reconsecrated. A survey of the export of catacomb relics throughout the world from 1578 to the 19th century, conducted by Pierre-Antoine Fabre and colleagues forthcoming from the École Française in Rome, has counted no fewer than 14,000. Here on the right, or sorry, on, on, the, on the left rather, is a particularly splendid example of one such catacomb saint, St. Gratian one of ten, who may still be seen reimagined in the dress of a Roman centurion, resplendent in the lace armour made for him by the Cistercian nuns of Valsassen in northern Bavaria. While this relic is of Rome, but now emphatically not in Rome, 
being almost a thousand kilometers uh, north or so of the city across the Alps. The image on the right, which will be known to many of you, of Caravaggio's famous altarpiece depicting the Madonna of Loreto appearing to two tired and dirty pilgrims on the threshold of her holy house, which had famously been translated several times until, according to tradition, it found its final and final resting place in a hilltop town inland from Ancona at the end of the 13th century. This altarpiece may still be found in situ, specifically in the chapel for which it was originally commissioned in the church of San Agostino, adjacent to Piazza Navona in the central area of the old city. So Roman traffic was therefore two-way. Pilgrims came to the city, but relics left the city in copious quantities. Likewise, Rome imported relics from elsewhere, notably the Holy Land, as exemplified in the Sancta Sanctorum, which had been a, a centerpiece of the original papal residence adjacent to Rome's cathedral, St. John Lateran. This connectedness of Rome with the wider Roman church, which may also be expressed in terms of Rome as particular place versus Rome as universal idea, could also be achieved by translating the sacred topography of post tridentine Rome onto its heroic early Christian prototype. It's surely no coincidence that the particularly powerful act of such spatio-temporal translation was carried out by Gregory Martin, main author of the Roman Catholic translation of the Vulgate into English, the, the Douay Reims Bible. Martin, who had spent 18 months in Rome between December 1575 and June 1578, was also author of what was, on the surface, a conventional enough pilgrim's guide to the Eternal City, beginning with its title, Roma Sancta, which harked back to the perennial genre of the Mirabilia Urbis Romae. However, for the biblical translator, Rome itself was an agent of the ultimate expression of translation in the Europe of the Age of Reformations, that is to say, conversion. Although Roma Sancta was to remain unpublished in full until 1969, extracts from it were published in around uh, 1597, not 1583, as on this title page, which I took off Ebo, a treatise of Christian peregrination. Here, as in the full version, Martin liberally studied his text with quotations from the early Christian fa fathers. One of Martin's absolute favourite writers was the one-time Archbishop of Constantinople, the 4th century St John Chrysostom, whose letter to the Romans... Chrysostom here was consciously, consciously modelling himself on St. Paul, Martin quotes at some length before saying, as often as I read it, I am ready to melt for joy. But mark the cause of his affection towards Rome, to wit, the bodies of the apostles lying there. And why the bodies? Because they carried the marks of the church. This is it that causeth pilgrimage. This consideration for the love of Christ and the honour of him inflame the godly father and all the best Christians in the primitive church to love sacred monuments, to be desirous to see them, to go far and near onto them, to touch, to kiss, to lick them, to weep in the place, to conceive such a lively imagination of things done by Christ and his saints and withal, such a sensible feeling of heavenly devotion that it was a pain to remove from thence, a death to dwell far off. Interestingly, Martin's Treatise of Peregrination was published together with several letters, including one to his sisters, quote, married to Protestants and themselves trained up in heresy, end quote. In this context, I do not think it is too far-fetched to argue that the space and place of Rome and the emotion it evoked in the mind of the devout Orthodox Catholic was considered by Martin as itself a persuasive agent of conversion. And such a notion is reinforced by the following passage, which is found in Roma Sancta itself. And I draw your attention to the italicized passage. And if anywhere a man stand nigh to these tombs, he perceiveth his sense by and by ravished with this said force. For the sight of the coffin entering into the heart pierceth it, stirreth it up, and moveth it in such a manner as if he that lieth there dead did pray with us and were visibly present to be seen. For Martin... Meditation upon material remains, which had borne witness to the same to the most heroic age in Christian history, could transport a person with the right interior disposition to early Christian Rome itself, thus collapsing 
time and space. But what are the little Romes which emerged in the wake of the conquistadores from Cartagena to Jusco, Mexico to Manila? Those settlements which by means of Roman relics and rituals identified themselves closely with the New Jerusalem on the Tiber. Here is one such, located in the indigenous settlement of Carabuco on the shores of Lake Titicaca in the Spanish colony of New Granada, just inside the borders of present-day Bolivia. My specific interest here focuses on the church's baptistry, whose fresco decorations, we'll see in a minute, were commissioned by the local Inca cacique, Agustin Signani, after the partial collapse of the building in 1763. As a counterpart to the baptism of Christ, shown here uh, on the left, there is a depiction of the baptism of Agustin's ancestor, Fernando, who was the first in his line to be baptised. Resplendent in his Inca tunic, the Uncu. Note the detail in the foreground of the crown on the cushion uh, in front of him. Sorry, I forgot my... This detail is picked up in the fresco on the opposite wall, which shows the Emperor Constantine, no less, being baptised by Pope Sylvester, who is easily identifiable uh, with his uh, tiara. See there. And the, see also the crown very much. Without any shadow of doubt, the source of this composition has been traced to the design made by Peter Paul Rubens, but executed by his assistants in 1622 for the tapestry of this scene woven in the Faubourg Saint Marcel workshop, Paris, between 1623 and 27. Uh, and you can see it there. I draw your attention not only to the details of the crown on the cushion, which actually, um, the observant among you will notice, is absent from this engraving which suggests that this engraving alone was not the means by which the composition was translated to South America. But the cleric holding the lighted candle, in the case of this here, it's the cardinal. Um, and you can see here, rather hum a humble figure uh, up there. And of course also, I draw attention as in a minute to, you'll, you'll, some of you will be asking, where are the um, spiral columns? And of course the spiral columns are shown throughout a little bit about that in a moment. So the depiction of the spiral corkscrew columns not only borders the scene itself, but it's also deployed elsewhere in the baptistry decoration, as I've just pointed out. This, of course, alludes to the columns from the Temple of Solomon, and the motif became a prominent feature of the Latin American Baroque, owing originally to the associations made by the first wave of mendicant missionaries to the Americas, oh, sorry, by the first wave of mendicant missionaries, and their, their projection onto the Americas as the supposed lands of Ophir and Tarshish, where the mines of Solomon were located. However, these spiral columns were also closely associated with that new Jerusalem on the Tiber, specifically the Basilica of St. Peter's itself. Since, so the tradition ran, Constantine had transported eight of them from Jerusalem to dedicate to decorate the high altar and presbytery of the old church. In the 17th century, Bernini had carefully relocated them in pairs of um, uh, in pairs at the four corners of the crossing to frame several of the basilica's uh, most precious relics. See it here uh, on the left, uh, the Veronica, and the, these are the obviously the columns on the right fragments of the True Cross and St. Helena beneath. Bernini had then reused the spiral column motif on a spectacular scale in the Baldacchino over the tomb of St. Peter himself, thereby dramatically reasserting the universal authority of the Pope as successor of the Prince of the Apostles. However, even more important than such typo typological references as evidence for the means by which Christianity was translated from the old to new worlds, may be seen in this picture of the interior of an even humbler church 
than that uh, in Carabuco. One dedicated to St. James the Great in the hamlet of Coparaque, some 200 kilometers west of Iticaca in the Peruvian highlands. Now, some years ago, I found myself in the position of being committed to giving a keynote in Milan on the subject of San Carlo Borromeo in the making of a world Catholicism. It had been my expectation to use evidence for the diffusion of the cult of San Carlo in the New World to argue for the reality of Tridentine Catholicism outside Europe. So you can imagine my dismay when the doyen of global missionary art for the early modern period, Govin Bailey, proudly informed me, and categorically so, via email, that in all his extensive travels throughout Latin America and Asia, he had not come across a single altar dedicated to the Archbishop Saint, and knew of only one church in America from the colonial period dedicated to him, and there it is. And this is the Mission Church of San Carlos in Puno, on the opposite shore of Lake Titicaca from Carabuco, whose facade, dating from 1797, you see before you, with, of course, San Carlo, who would have been in the, uh, was now empty, uh, niche. But my relief, any relief I might have found, indeed, was short-lived, since Bailey was quick to point out that the dedication owed, was owed more to the fact that the patrons of the church wished to honour the Spanish King Carlos III than evoke the memory of the Counter-Reformation Cardinal Archbishop of Milan. But this setback got me thinking, and setbacks are very creative. <laughs> and I realised that all along I'd been looking in the wrong place for evidence of the reception of Borromean ideas of pastoral reform. It is possible to see straight away, even though slightly dark slides, that both high altars here, on albeit very different scales, the one on the left, of course, are still our little country church in the Peruvian uplands, and on the right is none other than the Duomo of Milan. They both designed to provide a secure and prominent place for the display and storage of the consecrated host. Meanwhile, another prominent and ubiquitous visual detail of unambiguous Borromean inspiration is to be found even in the humblest churches of the Iberian Overseas Empire, the confession box. <coughs> Here on the right is the only one from the old world, that is uh, one of the very fine ones in the Jesuit church of San Fedeli, uh, just near La Scala in Milan, and the others are, the two central ones are both from Sucre in Bolivia, and the other one is from Tunia in the Bolivian highlands. The centrality of both these elements, of the uh, high altar ciborium and of the um, confessional, the centrality of these elements to Borromeo's pastoral vision may be seen from their prominent treatment in his handbook for outfitting churches of 1577, which was included in the 1583 edition of the Acts of the Milanese Church. Now, this publication was no dry collection of synodal legislation, but a veritable how-to manual to supply hard-pressed, busy prelates with practical advice about how to govern their diocese, give sermons, train priests, build and outfit churches. As such, it should be considered the practical counterpart to the theory enshrined in the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. Its popularity was such that Borromeo's counterparts as reforming prelates in Central and South America came to, came to consider the Archbishop of Milan as their model and their prototype. Furthermore, at least one con near contemporary drew direct comparisons between Borromeo and the prelate who summoned what historians still consider to have been the Trent of the Americas, the Third Provincial Council of Lima in 1582 to 1583. He was Toribio de Mocavejo, Archbishop of Lima uh, from 1581 until his death from overwork in 1606. Just as, to quote Fitz de Burr, penance was the master key of Borromean spirituality, so for the Jesuit José de Acosta, who was one of the four theologians in attendance at the Council of Lima, mutual intelligibility in the confession box between the indigenous um, penitent and his or her confessor was of paramount importance. It is Acosta who is credited with overseeing translation into two of the preeminent languages of the former Inca Empire, Quechua and Aymara, 
of a short catechism for lay instructors to repeat with their pupils, a longer one for more advanced converts, and the writing of a grammar, a confession manual, and a collection of sermons, which, at the specific behest of the Third Council of Lima, were to constitute such an important um, pastoral resource. As you can see here, they are the three languages. For Acosta, as outlined in his famous missionary manual on the procuring of the salvation of the Indians, which, although not published until his return after his return to Spain in 1588, was already complete by 1576, the sine qua non of the effectiveness of the missions was the capacity of the missionaries to be able to communicate in the Indians' own language. Quote, For me, the priest that accepts the office of parroco without knowing the language of the Indians, and I have believed this for a long time, and I keep on affirming it, that person is just ruining his soul, end quote. Acosta went on to explain how this was true in the very basic sense that such a priest could not administer the sacrament of penance. Quote, if he doesn't know what the Indian is confessing, nor will the Indian be able to understand what is commanded of him. Acosta went on to praise the Incas for their wisest use of the device of the general language, the lengua geral of Quechua, which is spoken and understood, at least by the elite, if not by all the common people, throughout the extensive lands of their empire. However, for Acosta, the most effective way to negotiate what he referred to as a veritable jungle of languages, idiomatum tam multiplex silvasit, was to make cautious yet concerted use of the at least bilingual offspring of Spanish fathers and Indian mothers, the mestizos. Acosta insisted that the Indian languages, though multiple, were not that difficult to learn compared to, say, Hebrew or even Latin and Greek. However, he was not blind to their qualities. Quote, Yet in their uncultured barbarity, they have some ways of saying things that are so beautiful and eloquent, and other expressions that are so admirably concise that they say many things in one that give us such delight. And when we wish to express in Latin or in Spanish all the power of one of these words, we would have to employ many, and yet scarcely would we cover all the meaning. But of course, when it came to spiritual or philosophical matters, the Indians' languages were found wanting. So that, in Acosta's opinion, and this is very much a trope, it's not, not a, he's not the only person to say this, it did not make sense to attempt to translate such key Christian concepts as faith, cross, angel, virginity, and even marriage, but rather leave these in Spanish. Here, Acosta might well have had in mind the initial error made just a few decades earlier by his confrere Francis Xavier in Japan, where, misadvised by his guide and interpreter, the Japanese pirate Anjiro, the Jesuit missionary had first used the Japanese concept Dainichi, the pantheistic deity revered by the Buddhist Shingon sect, to translate God, before realizing his fundamental error and reverting to the use of Latin, or at least Latinate words, Deus, Deusi which were slightly adapted so as to work better than when spoken by the Japanese. I intend to deal more fully with such cultural mistranslations in the written version of this paper, building on the insights of, among others, Mark Christensen, who in a recent study of what he calls Nahua and Maya Catholicisms has emphasised the multiplicity of Christian texts in, ind in indigenous tongues, which were circulating in Central America and in particular, the importance of those texts intended for indigenous audiences which were not written by linguistically gifted missionaries, but, to use his words, by natives for natives. And these have largely been overlooked by historians since such texts circulated in manus manuscripts. However, here at the conference, I can be sure that one of tomorrow's <coughs> plenary speakers, John paul Rubies, will be have interesting things to say about such creative um, mis understandings. A more difficult challenge to the efficacy of missionary work, Acosta believed, was provided by the most truly barbarous pronunciation characteristic of many Indian tongues, that's his phrase, and how their users, quote, appeared to be gargling in their throats rather than talking. 
The key thing was to overcome any sense of shame and embarrassment when attempting to deliver sermons in the Indian languages, he said. As he pithily put it, we have to make many mistakes to learn not to make any mistakes. Saipi et audacta erandum ut arequando non ereto. He concluded this chapter with an emphasis on the importance of simplicity and repetition, a strategy that he noted had been used with particular effectiveness by Francis Xavier with the simple fisherfolk of the Malabar coast, as well as with an evocation of a practice he believed was widespread in the primitive church, that of reading out sermons in native tongues which had been written by others but which were accompanied by guidance so as to ensure that the correct intonation and pronunciation was employed. In this sense, uh, Nahuatl in particular, it was a tonal language. It was very important to get your tone right. Indeed, the importance of correct pronunciation to the correct communication of meaning was also an obsession of the author of what is to date still the most comprehensive grammar of Nahuatl, that by the Jesuit Horacio Carocci, published in 1645. But to wrap up, what does this slow, decidedly messy, and far from conclusive attempt to translate the Christian message to at least two of the four parts of the then known world during the early modern period add up to? According to Lamin Sane, who I quoted in my call for papers, it has been precisely the triumph of the translatability of Christianity which has made it the world religion that it is today. But even if the story I have tried to tell this afternoon has been decidedly less triumphalist, I hope you will agree with me that it is all the more interesting for that. And I leave you, if I can find my drawer again, with a pair of tantalising images of the patron saint of translators, both of which are from Asia, which I have not had time to deal with today. The one on the left, by the Mughal artist Kezu Das, is based on an engraving of Michelangelo's Noah from the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Well, that on the right, in a modern frame, was carved probably in the 17th century by an anonymous Chinese craftsman working in Manila. Carved out of African ivory, brought most probably in Portuguese ships, and then once carved, transported again, this time by the Spanish silver fleet on its return journey from the Philippines to Acapulco in New Spain. It was then taken overland before being transported once more by ship, this time across the Atlantic to Seville, where it became a prized possession of a succession of private collectors down to this day. This small, exquisitely portable object of devotion is a fitting one with which to bring this highly selective survey of the global circulation of the sacred to a close since it serves to remind us that, for all its slow, incomplete and halting nature, it was precisely the portability and tradability of such devotional objects as much as the linguistic translatability of its key text that has enabled Christianity to become the world religion it most definitely is today. Thank you.